Hi everyone, welcome back to Simpro Chats with Daz and Ads. My name's Adam, I'm from AMAC Consulting and my partner in crime as always. I'm Darren from Platinum Consultants. Great to be here, great to be here with you today on this unfortunately rainy Melbourne type weather in Perth. Hope everyone is surviving the COVID lockdowns there in Melbourne. We feel for you here in WA and um, we're hopefully going to give you some great information today to take your mind off whatever it is that's going on there and positively affect the way you're doing business. So what's our topic for today, Ads? Awesome. Well, today is actually a bit of a, is, is going to be a planned two-part episode. So this is actually um, one of those rare occasions that Daz and Ads actually have a bit of foresight to, un- to realize that an hour and a half long episode probably isn't appropriate. So we are planning on splitting this in half. Um, and part one and part two are going to focus on catalogs, um, which is a pretty hot topic that I hear a lot of people talking about all the time. Um, so what we've decided to do is kind of take the catalogs and split them in half with the first part being looking at the actual structure of the catalogs and how they work inside the system and the best way to utilize them. And part two being more of an operational um, overview of catalogs. So um, in the first part, we're going to, I'm just referring to my notes because we actually have notes. So the first part, we're going to be talking about things like what are catalogs, the difference between catalogs and stock, the structure of catalogs, um, suppliers importing, uh, maintaining, and your maintenance of your catalogs, with part two being more around the operational side of things like search terms, linked items, pack quantities, and supplier quantities, images and attachments, units and measurements, and all that sort of fun stuff. So um, yeah, part one should be, um, well, they're both going to be really good, Um, but yeah, uh, it'll be good. So Daz, why don't you kick us off, my friend? Um, let's start having a chat about what a catalog item actually is, because I know from doing an implement, I know from doing implementations that a lot of people say when we start talking about catalog items and we start actually going through what a catalog item actually is, really trying to explain the key differences between catalogs versus stock and and all that sort of jazz. So, in your words, my friend, what is a catalog item? So to any of my customers, hello out there, you'll recognize this because I use a very similar one each time. Yep. The, if you've ever received a catalog from a supplier, you know, those big books that have all the colored pictures in them, mm-hmm. that is a catalog. It's things that you could buy, you could sell to your customers, but as of right now, they're just on a piece of paper, they're available to you, but nothing has been purchased. And then stock is something that uh, you have bought. And if you look out the back, you'll see it on the shelf somewhere and that is stock. So a catalog item essentially is a list of things you could buy or sell. You can order it sometimes. Sometimes a catalog item might just be something called consumables. So it's something you can use in quotes, in jobs, in orders and on invoices. Yep, absolutely. I mean, from my perspective, um, and and again, for for all my customers out there, so the catalog item is essentially something that you could buy or sell, um, or it's like your your digital price book. Um, So if people still have a little bit um, uh, trouble conceptualizing what it is, I basically say to them, you know those big old fat massive clips or price books that you used to be able to get? And they're like, yep. And I'm like, you used to literally just flick through pages to find the particular GPO that you're after. Yep. It's the exact same thing, just in a digital format. Instead of flicking through pages, you're just searching text in, in Simpro. That's the exact same thing. Um, so hopefully that kind of clarifies what a catalog item actually is. So in terms of, we, we touched on it, um, obviously the difference between catalog and stock. So catalog is something that you can buy or sell or stock is something that you actually have bought. Um, is there really anything else that you wanted to add to that? Does or do you think it's there, there is actually I there's also a very important difference with the way it's treated on a job. So we're not going to go really deep into this, but just to give you um, a key bit of information, a catalog item when you add it from the catalog to a job doesn't cost anything as far as the job's concerned. Mm-hmm. Whereas a stock item, when you take it out of stock and you put it on a job, although you're selling exactly the same item at the same price 
And you can even see a cost price on the catalog item. As far as Simpro is concerned, you didn't actually buy the catalog item, mm -hmm. but the stock item you did buy. And mm -hmm. so the actual cost of the job only changes when you add a catalog item. Sorry, when you add a stock item, not when you add a catalog item. And that's a key point. If you want to accurately track the costs of jobs, you must have stock. It doesn't have to be an accurate quantity in stock, and we'll cover that in another episode after this one. Mm -hmm. But we do need to be able to take something out of stock to add into the job so it costs money, not just as an item to sell. So that's a key difference between catalog and stock. Yeah, totally. And again, I kind of going to analogies because as trainers, we love analogies. Um, right. So it's basically saying to someone, I'm going to send you an invoice for um, a mobile phone. I'm looking at one, so I'm going to use that as an example. I'm going to send you an invoice for a mobile phone. So you're going to pay me money for that phone. But until I actually send that to you or fulfill that order, all I've done is taken a whole bunch of money from you without actually incurring any loss. So I haven't provided you a service for what you've paid me. So from that sense, that's a massive difference. So if you're just adding catalog items to your jobs, all you're really doing is just facilitating a sale. You're not providing anything to the customer. Um, it, the same could be said about um, for labor. I'm going to sell you five hours of labor, but until I actually go out to site and do the work, it hasn't cost me anything as a business. So again, another key, uh, there, there's really no difference in, in selling labor or selling a catalog item until you provide the work or the service or the part, it's not costing you anything as a business. So um, yep. big differences there between selling stock and selling catalogs. Absolutely. So what you put on the parts and labor tab, that's what you're selling. And if you schedule it or time goes on, or if you buy it or take it from stock, that's what it's costing. Absolutely. So now another big thing that is very important for any new Simpro user to make a decision about, but also those people that have been using Simpro for a long time who may want to reassess what they're doing with the catalog is the structure. How should I structure my catalog? Can I just throw a whole heap of catalog items all together? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Should you structure it with groups and subgroups and sub subgroups, which by the way, a group is essentially just like a folder. Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no right and wrong way to do it. It has to be done the best way for ease of use within the system. Yep. So there's all kinds of different types of structures. For example, the most common structure, which I don't agree with, I don't think it's the right thing to do. And I think it's a mistake. I think my opinion is clear on that is grouping it by supplier. I think that's a wrong thing to do. Now I will add there's little asterisks supplier and manufacturer are not the same thing. The supplier is the person you buy it from, but sometimes they are the manufacturer too. And I'll give you an example setting up the structure so that for a HVAC company, you buy direct from Dakin, you can buy direct from Fujitsu. So I would set it up where I've got all my Dakin units in, in a Dakin folder, potentially a Dakin group. Maybe I'll put it in units and then under that will be Dakin, Fujitsu, Mitsubishi, whoever. But I wouldn't create a group for Bunnings and one for Reese and one for MM Electrical and one for CNW. And then, you know, because they all sell similar things. Mm -hmm. so the first thing I would say is don't set it up by supplier, but it is okay to set it up by manufacturer if you like. What mm -hmm. are some other options of how you could set up your catalog? Yeah. So, I mean, again, this kind of comes, this is going to, this is eventually going to lead into one of the next topics we got, which is talking about things like, um, how to import catalogs from your suppliers. Most of the time, depending on the, well, I say most of the time, depending on the uh, industry type that you have, or that you are, whether you're electrical or plumbing and whatnot, if you're going to be importing your price files from your suppliers, more often than not, those price files are already pre-formatted and they're not going to be pre-formatted in the, the fact that you're buying it from MIDI's or MMEM or AWM or whoever it may be, they will actually be pre-formatted by the part type. So like you were talking about, like Bakelite, for example, you would open up Bakelite and you might have a whole series of um, items or a whole series of subgroups for Bakelite. So um, that is, they are the most common ways that we do see them. So I guess I'm, I'll double back to what you were saying before as well, in terms of 
setting them up per um, per supplier. Sometimes you don't have it. Sometimes if, if time is of the essence, you're getting Simpra up and running. Sometimes you don't really have a choice. Sometimes you're just going to import whatever you've got. If your um, suppliers give the price files to you and they don't really have any groups or subgroups set up and they basically just say, here's a list of 300 parts that you can buy from us. Um, you can go through that um, spreadsheet and format it prior to importing it into the system. Some people just don't have time to do that. And they're like, this is what I've got. I've got to get it in. Okay, well, fine. Let's just get it in under that um, supplier, under the supplier name. And then we can kind of move things around as you use them because you can always import them and then tr and move stock from one group to another group. That's fine to do. Um, but yeah, so the different types of catalog items or the different types of grouping conventions that I generally come across are, um, as you've mentioned, supplier or um, generally through product type or manufacturer. Um, they're probably the three most common ways that I see the catalogs have been imported into the system. And generally speaking, it's more often than not based on the catalog that you've been provided, not the catalog that you're putting together. Yeah. So a couple of uh, quick tips about, you know, how you decide how you're going to structure it or, you know, how, if you're going to have a discussion on that, mm -hmm. I would say Simpro search is really good. It's very fast. It's easy to do. So if you know what you're looking for, it actually doesn't matter how you structure it because you're going to search for it and you're going to find it in a few seconds flat. Mm -hmm. If you're building this for people who aren't quite sure what they want or they want to browse, that's mm -hmm. going to make a big difference. We want to put them into categories so they can easily browse. Yeah. If there's more than 250 items in a group, you can't browse because actually it'll be over page after page after page. So I would normally say if you get more than sort of 150, 200 items in one particular group and you want to be able to easily browse, I would say split those into subgroups to make it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. So think about who's going to be using the catalog the most and think about who, how they would think, how they, how they understand parts. Yeah. Because the other key thing to think of is it's not just finding the parts. When I need to actually put a new part in the system, if I'm an admin person and I don't understand, I don't even know what Bakelite is, for example. Mm -hmm. What is Bakelite? Bakelite hasn't been around since the 70s. Why is there a group called Bakelite? And of course, we understand that. It's the way the PowerPoints and uh, other plates used to be, but they still keep that name in, even though they're PVC. But maybe not everyone knows your terminology and so an admin person who comes across an item that's been purchased on an invoice, they need to create in these groups. So don't go too crazy. Keep them quite generic, especially, I would say, the top level. So the, the groups that you see when you open the catalog for the first time, my recommendation is do not go above 20 groups at that level. Mm -hmm. Keep it less than 20 groups. If you have to scroll up and down your catalog groups, you've already lost time. Yeah. And any, any time you spent trying to get these things all nice and neat, you've wasted it because now there's, there's too much scrolling and I've got to figure out which group does it go in? Oh, is it this one? Is it that one? You're just wasting time. Less groups, more searching. Mm -hmm. so go to your catalog. If you've got one, if you have to scroll at all in the top level, in my opinion, somebody's wasting time, reduce your groups, make it faster and easier. So, so my question to you does, seeing as you're our Simpro um, dinosaur. Um, <laughs> I thought you were going to say expert, but I'll take dinosaur. Let's go dinosaur. Okay, hang on. They had small brains, didn't they? Damn it. Yeah, I think I've called dinosaur quite a few times now. Um, so if you're importing your catalogs, let's just say that you're a Sparky and you've imported the MMEM -MM, um, yep. and the MIDIs and maybe... Um, I don't know who's another one, MME and MIDI's and Rexel, for example, yeah. three different catalogs. All three suppliers have three different type of grouping conventions. Those you do, you decide to automate your importing. So you get the automated inputs turned on. So Simpro just sucks them in through the API. Um, what happens then? Because that's going to probably give you at least 60 groups where we're talking about, you don't want to scroll too much. You've got 60 to hundred groups before you even start getting into the subgroups yep. gets out of control so quickly and it becomes yep. very overwhelming because you might search again. I'm just going to keep picking on um, electrical products. So 
you're searching an electrical product and you search a PowerPoint. So you've typed in 2025 WE. You notice when you've searched that in, you've got one part that says CLI 2025 WE. You've got one part that says 2025 WE. You've got another part that says 2025 WE. So technically there's three different parts all being the same thing, probably living in three different groups with different subgroups and different sub subgroups. Yep. What do you do if it gets that out of control and things are just all over the place? Um, firstly, I think I got a little bit older. That was the world's longest question. But secondly, <laughs> I'm more of a dinosaur than I was before. Um, it is a very good question. And it is one of the uh, most difficult to handle situations. And it's probably why you've brought it up, I'm guessing. It's something you have to handle from early on. So the point one, never import directly from the API not update. I didn't say update. I said import. I do not think you should ever do that because that's going to grab um, roughly 10,000 items of which 9,800 you probably don't use. And there's another 500 that you do use that's not in that list. Mm -hmm. First point, import. We're kind of getting into importing now, which is fine. It's on one of the next uh, topics anyway. So import from the suppliers, things I have purchased in the last 12 months list. Sometimes you can download them depending on the supplier. Sometimes mm -hmm. you have to specifically ask them for the list. It's okay when you're asking them. It's okay if the pricing isn't correct because we can update the pricing. What we're after is a list of items that you've used before. Mm -hmm. Now, even when you get this list, which might have a thousand or 1200 or 2000 items on it, a lot of those were a one time only purchase but I can guarantee you out of 10 time, 10,000 items, which you'll import, that's one supplier import mm -hmm. from the API or from their top list, 9,800 of them are things that you've never ordered before. So it's a complete waste. So the first point is only import what you've purchased in the past. The second point is, is that I probably wouldn't import all three suppliers in the first instance. I would ask the customer, which supplier do you use the most, which, and then there's also a, a sort of a part B to that. And also which suppliers uh, part number and name do you like the best? And we would import those ones because some of them have atrocious and terrible names. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you know, uh, Reese and trade link, there's Kembla. It doesn't even say copper tube. It says Kembla. And then Crane is another one, C-R-A-N-E. Apparently that's Copper Tube. It's just because it's a brand name. So I want a half inch crane, please. It's mm -hmm. not a very tiny crane that lifts heavy things. It's <laughs> actually Copper Tube. And yeah. you know, Kembla, unless you're in the industry, you've never heard of that before. It's actually Copper Tube. It's just a brand name. So we don't really want it to be called Kembla. So you might want to choose another supplier that actually has a generic name or you got time to go through and replace it all. So step one, don't import the full list through the API. Step two, if you need to ask your supplier for the most recent list of uh, items purchased in the last 12 months or two years, mm -hmm. step three, import those from your main supplier only. And then if there's other suppliers, what you can do is you have a choice. My opinion is don't import them and add them to the existing products that already exist as you buy them from other suppliers. So if you're going to buy a hundred meters of, of um, 2.5 TPS, look it up. It's got, um, you know, Lawrence and Hansen's details on it, open it up and add another supplier to that rather than creating a separate item. So that's my recommendations. And that way you have complete control of what goes in. It's not out of control on day one. Mm -hmm. And it takes only, I don't know, when you get used to Simpro, 15 seconds, 30 seconds maybe for, for slow typers to put a product in. Mm -hmm. But you could lose 30 seconds every time you're searching through a 50,000 item database. Mm -hmm. So for all the time you're saving, which you're not really, by having them all in there and not having to create it, you're forcing every single person extra time to go through and like find an item which there's 12 of them that look exactly the same and they don't know which one's which well this yep. one's got a c after it so this is the one we want well why is that oh we just know that's that's the one we use <laughs> if we never imported the ones you don't use that wouldn't have been a problem mm -hmm. so that's that's my recommendation 
import only one supplier for a particular sort of type of product, add other suppliers to it as you go, and uh, only import what you've used in the past, not everything. Yeah. But so think, updating is a different thing. Yeah, I was just going to say, so do you think it's also not a bad idea to have your catalog evolve with products that you've purchased? So if you're buying products and you're importing the um, supplier uh, invoices, generally speaking, importing the supplier invoices will create the catalog items for you. So yep. what you're then doing is you're then building your catalog based on the products that you're actually purchasing inside of Simpro. So get yep. your baseline products in using your last 12 months purchases from your main wholesaler and then continue to build and evolve your catalog around the products that you've actually purchased. Maybe then spend maybe an hour a fortnight or an hour a month going through that no group. Cause generally when you do import a supplier invoice, it will just dump it in the no group if that doesn't exist because it doesn't know where to put it and just recategorize things or just add them to existing parts. It's going to maybe take you an hour a month. And it will just save you so much time in the long run by building your catalog with what you're actually buying rather than just dumping in. I mean, that how, how many parts are in that full Lawrence and Hansen catalog, that old school one? 80,000, 80, 90,000 in, yeah. in a real full catalog. Yeah. Um, they don't release all those products now. It's more like about 40 or 50,000. Yeah. But 50,000 parts, man. Who needs 50,000 parts in their in their catalog that's and who who needs ten thousand parts that nine thousand eight hundred you've never seen or heard of or used in your mm. life <laughs> yeah because i mean if you're a project company generally a lot of the parts that you're going to be um tendering out for are going to be specified by the builder anyway or, or the tender document so they're probably going to be one-off items until you decide to buy them because you're just putting them in there just to get a price point um Yep. And if then we them, they're on the invoice, aren't they? So then they'll get automatically created. And it's just a, it's a yeah. task then exactly as you said, somebody for once a week, every second week, once a month, go through the no group and decide, is this an item we're going to buy again? Yes. Then the next thing is, is this an item that's in the catalog under a different supplier? So I should merge it. Or is it a new item? We've never bought that before from anyone. Let's move it to the right group and subgroup. Totally. It doesn't need to take long. Up front, it's going to take a bit of time because the first few weeks, there's probably lots of items that are not in the catalog already. Mm -hmm. But then as time goes on, by the time you get to month three or four, there's only a couple of items here or there that are being purchased to look through. And the catalog is such a critical um, building block of Simpro and getting Simpro right from the beginning. If, you're, if you start Simpro with a catalog that's so out of control that you can't even find it. You, you can't find the most common, commonly used part. If you start going back to Reese's website, you jump on Reese Max to then find the part, to then go back inside of Simpro to then search for that. You're, you're double handling so much. And I see that happen so much where someone will be looking at the Simpro catalog. The part's there. It exists. They can't find it. So they go to the Reese Max portal, locate the part on there because it's easy to find copy the part number, go back inside of Simpro, paste that part number in Simpro to then find the part. It's such a long, tedious process. Yeah. And uh, I'll give you an example of how bad it gets. So Jono, if you're out there, this is for you. Uh, one of my first customers that I ever went to back in the dinosaur years, as you would say, <laughs> uh, they had... Dark years had imported different catalogs and had done this and added more and imported some more. And they had all the different catalogs in there. This is, this is no joke Four million products in the catalog. And my first gig was how do we bring this down to products that we actually use? So this is a very large company that did, it was electrical that did everything from testing and tagging all the way through to large hospitals, large mining projects, residential commercial they did the whole lot right mm -hmm. they ended up whittling down from four million which there were countless duplicates took us about six months to less than four thousand so my my recommendation is if you've got more than four thousand products in your catalog which would be quite rare i would guarantee you that most of those whatever you've got above four thousand they're not actually being used mm-hmm so a typical example is two to three thousand maybe 
If you've got 5,000 in your catalog, it's still manageable. Once you get beyond 5,000, you can't manage more than 5,000. You can't possibly look at each item and know whether it's the right price for 5,000. Mm -hmm. um, 2,000, even that's a stretch, but maybe. We're talking about the structure of them. We started talking about the importing. So you can obviously import into, into Simpro through generic price files, and you can also set up the API imports as well. So um, from a technical perspective, the API stands for an application program interface, if that's correct. Yes. Cool. Okay, cool. Um, so from there, essentially what it's doing is Simpro is going to be sending a, a call to someone else's website to check if there's been an update to a price. If there has, it's going to grab that data from their website and then import it into your Simpro build and then update the price. And if the part doesn't exist, it'll just create it. So a couple of ways you can do it. You can create the catalog items yourselves just manually. You can import what's called a generic price file, which is a non-supplier formatted price file, or you can import their price file if it's a CSV document, or you can set the API up to automatically import them. So you've got quite a few options and really depending on what you're trying to achieve as a business will probably dictate which option you decide to start using. Um, Daz has given you some, some really good pointers in terms of what he thinks is a good way to, um, to structure your catalog based on his experience. I agree with everything he said. I think everything he said is absolutely sound. It's valuable and it's really good feedback um, and advice for those of you out there that have got your catalog and it's already been imported and it's currently out of control. That's a completely different chat. It's something that you're going to have to start figuring out how you're going to manage it. There's no way to just delete everything that, that you just don't want. There's, it's a manual process of oh, archiving. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very quickly on that. Um, I did become an expert after the trial by fire of bring my 4 million catalog price items down to 4,000. Mm -hmm. We did make a lot of mistakes and we fixed them and made more mistakes and fixed them. But just a few really quick pointers if you're looking at handling and getting your catalog back up to date. Mm -hmm. There is a report that says um, assign, uh, sorry, archive catalog items report. It'll look at all the catalog items to see whether or not you've used them recently. I want to make it clear that that report isn't faultless. There are certain times where you haven't used the item that will not show in that report. For example, that item might be in pre-builds. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, it doesn't show on that report, but it is an essential part of the pre-build. Mm -hmm. You may not have purchased with it, but it might be in there uh, for the purpose of, you know, consumables or sundry items or something else that's adding to the cost of the pre-build without actually being something that you use or buy or sell. Yeah. Just purely budgeting purposes. Yeah. 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 So be very careful. Don't just use that report and just archive everything you see because it's possible that it was used in some circumstance that doesn't show up on that report. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that report is a very good report to start off with. What, I, what is the list of catalog items that I haven't used? Now let me look deeper in those and see whether or not any of those appear. And you can do search terms, um, possibly even when you, an easy way to do it is if you export your pre-build list, that will actually give you a list of every catalog item that you've used in a pre-build that mm -hmm. you can compare with the list of unused items from mm -hmm. that archive report. Just be careful if you delete, delete can have a devastating purpose uh, yeah, it can cause all kinds of problems. It can remove items off your quotes out of your pre-builds. If you haven't actually ordered it or used it on an invoice, uh, it can actually remove it from items that are in Simpro. So be very careful. Now I did notice that I think they fixed it now. So yeah, that yeah. you have to remove one out of uh, quotes, but I'm I do sure if you tried I'm pretty sure if you try and delete something now and it's inside of a quote, it won't actually delete it. It'll yeah, just it used it. to It'll yeah, that, it and leave it on the quote. I'm pretty sure pre-builds is still an issue. If it's in a pre-build, it will just disappear off the pre-build. If you archive something, I actually was helping a customer out the other day. I tested it. So if you have a item in a pre-build 
and you archive that part, I don't think it removes it off the pre build. No, delete, delete is there. I so delete, yeah. anyone anyone who has been through my training knows that the first delete anything. first rule of Simpro is we don't delete. Yep. No hitting the back arrow. Hit save as often as you can. Do not delete. The D word is a is a rude word in our training. There's no undo button in Simpro either. So once it's gone, it's gone. Um, yeah. But yeah. So I mean, I guess double downing what you've just said. If you're if you're half decent at Excel as well, one of the easiest things that you can do is export your catalog, export your pre builds. Yeah. Set up a V. If you don't know what this is, Google it because it's so valuable. Set up a VLOOKUP and then grab your list of catalog items out of your pre-builds, drop them in that spreadsheet of the catalog items and set up what's called a value lookup. So what it's going to do is it's going to set up a VLOOKUP in your um, catalog items and say, if this part exists in a pre-build, then it will say yes over here, for example. Anything that doesn't have a yes next to it, is not in a is not in a pre-build, so they're the ones that you pro potentially may want to archive if they're not in that list of items that you've never used. So there are a few very quick and easy steps that you can set up to identify and verify what parts are being used from a purchasing perspective and which parts are being used at a pre-build perspective. So. If you need some help with that, reach out um, because we can help. Um, not something you have to sit there and Google, but if you want to have a crack, it's called a VLOOKUP and it's incredible. Yep. If you, if you just need to get your catalog sorted and you don't know where to start and you just want to make someone else do it for you, um, speak to Ads. He's a catalog expert. He'll sort you out. You sure you don't want it? <laughs> um i'll i'll take your overflow how's that <laughs> yeah. um no i if you if you want to come through me i'm quite happy to help you with the catalog i uh i've done it a lot and i'm quite good with excel as as ads is so either one of us can definitely handle what you need yeah. i was just uh just jokingly handle <laughs> those because they they are notoriously difficult they so, are it's um, and just a word of advice like <laughs> there's no one out there that's going to be a perfect at fixing your catalog because for me for example i'm not a, i'm i don't have a tr i don't have a trade background so you're going to say i want to keep all of my da 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 parts and i'll be like i don't know what they are i can tell you what you've used from a data integrity perspective and everything else but if you're trying to get me to sift through a catalog and find all your cable unless it's probably got the word cable or tps or something that i understand that i've come across i'm not going to be able to find it so um yeah there's there's things that we can do to make this process a lot quicker but ultimately you still need to be involved in this process because it's yeah, your yeah. catalog and they're your parts so if you do come to us unfortunately we will still give you some homework to do to go away and look at this list and see what you need to keep and what you don't need to keep but we yeah. can whittle it down to at least the items you know that we think needs might need to be kept mm -hmm. so a few do's and don'ts of maintaining your catalog I mm -hmm. want to say when or if you have a supplier that has an automatic catalog update, which there are lots of suppliers in Simpro, you know, CNW and uh, MIDI's and MM Electrical and Reese and Rexel and Samios and a whole heap of them. Mm -hmm. If you turn it on, it is my recommendation you turn update only on. Mm -hmm. Don't do update and create because you will get those 10,000 items back in your catalog that you tried so hard not to put in in the first place. Be very careful. So many people have ruined their catalog or someone else in their business ruined it for them uh, that they spent hours and hours. And there's one particular guy who uh, I won't name because you might, might, someone might say, is that you mate? Uh, he did it twice. He <laughs> act, yeah. He one time his uh, receptionist did it and ticked it on. Now when I say he did it, he fixed his catalog whittled it away to perfection and then a receptionist came thought it was a good idea tick the box and bang 10,000 items went back in there oh that's then, unlucky sadly there was an update done in simpro and it refreshed all of that stuff and it ticked the box accidentally for him it wasn't user it was an update that did it and it put them all back in for a third time 
So uh, he is now also an expert at fixing his catalog because he's done it three times over. So don't tick that box, update only. Uh, the second thing is, is that you want to merge products that are the same product. Don't merge products that are similar products because that'll affect your stock, which we're going to do in another episode. Mm -hmm. So um, when you merge two products together, you'll have one product with two suppliers, two part numbers. It will find the supplier within a product. So mm -hmm. the main part number that you see, which is the catalog part number, which isn't the same as a supplier part number, mm -hmm. the catalog part number we can use for updating the catalog overall, the supplier part number, that's what it actually uses to um, update your products when you're using these automatic or manual imports through CSV. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that's helped a little bit. Uh, is there anything else that you want to add? Um, maybe the part one needs to be a two part episode almost. I, know. I, was, I was actually just thinking that I'm like, Gosh, we we're going to try and keep this short and sharp. So um, we said two parts. We meant four part episodes of catalog. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. Catalog's one of those funny things, man, where the more you talk about it, the more there is to talk about. Yeah. Um, I know that's a weird statement to make, but it, 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 yeah. We only scrape the surface. There's so much more, so much. And then I don't even, I mean, just in the topics we covered, we could go much deeper than we have, but hopefully we haven't even really spoken about favorites or searching or save searches or anything like that. So we'll, uh, yeah, we'll add that into, into part two and hopefully uh, we'll speed talk. But if um, yeah, do, do you have anything else you want to add on this episode? No, not really. I, like I'd like to probably leave it there because there's a lot of information to digest um, and to try and think about, not just digest, also think about and implement as well. Like Discuss with your other uh, Simpro users as well. Yeah, there's, there's going to be a lot of people in your business that probably will have a say about how they want it to work. Like your estimators are probably going to want it to work differently to your, to your stock yeah. foreman, which probably going to want it different to your operations, which is different to finance. Everyone's going to want it to work in their own special way. So it's something that you really need to discuss as a business yeah. and, and really find the best way to manage it, the best way to format it and structure it. And once you do do it um, to avoid any in accidental things happening to it, there's nothing wrong with then jumping into the security groups and locking it down. So it can't be changed. So, yep. Yeah. And I just want to say one last thing regarding all of this. There is technically, regardless of, of my opinion and, and the experience I've had with all the different customers, there is no right and wrong with the catalog. It's just how it works best for you. So if the how it works best for you doesn't match with what we said, that's completely fine. It, you know, how, if you ask my wife how, how the, uh, the shelving around our kitchen should be stacked, I think the bowls should be in this cupboard. She thinks that's where the cups should go. It's, everyone has a different idea about how to do it and it's okay. Uh, you just have to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So if you disagree with anything I said, that's completely okay. Uh, you're wrong, but it's okay. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but you just, just keep in mind, don't change your whole system. If it's working for you, great. If it's not working for you, Hopefully some of these tips that we gave you will help you out into know maybe how you could restructure it to make it easier to use. And the only right person here was Shan telling you where the... <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's why they are where she thinks they should be. Um, yep. Admittedly, she, she does spend um, more time cooking amazing meals than I do in the kitchen. So she gets to choose... And plus, she's the boss. She is the boss. We all know. Even, <laughs> even Grace, my daughter, knows it. <laughs> well, Grace is second in charge and you're just... Yes. I'm third. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, cool. On that, on that note, we're going to wrap this episode up. So thank you so much for joining in and, and watching. Like Daz said, hopefully we've helped you out somewhat or given you some food for thought. Um, again, I'm Adam from AMAC Consulting. I can be reached at info at amac.consulting. Daz, where can everyone reach you, my friend? So you can reach me at platinumconsultants.com.au. My email is darren at platinumconsultants.com.au. Looking forward to hearing from anybody. And don't forget, as always, like and subscribe. If you, if you do like this, please help us. Please like it and please do subscribe. There's some good information here. We're doing this just to help you. Hopefully yeah. it does help. Yeah. Let us and know. Share, and sharing is caring. Share it around with anyone, any of your Simpro user friends that you think might be able to... Um, to to benefit from these chats um but until next time we will see you then see you then bye bye